Investing in gold doesn't have to be complicated. I'm Colin Plume, the CEO of Noble Gold Investments, and I want to take the time to show you how investing in a gold IRA can help you hedge your bets against inflation and other economic concerns on the horizon. Visit Noble Gold Investments and get our free gold investment guide on buying gold the right way. And make sure you're investing with the right company. Visit noblegoldinvestments.com. Good evening. I'm still reporting on the coup. Now remember, please like, share, and subscribe below. Loy Brunson is a constitutional scholar and one of four Brunson brothers. One of his greatest discoveries about the U.S. Constitution is that members of Congress do not have the broad immunity that many of them think they do. The revelation about congressional immunity may soon play a huge role in an upcoming case that may soon come before the United States Supreme Court. At this time, the Supremes could make a decision that would remove the president, vice president, and a sizable majority of members of Congress from their roles as representatives of the people of the United States of America for refusing to do any sort of examination of the results of the 2020 election. Failure to take on the constitutional responsibility, regardless of what Mike the Traitor Pence has to say on the matter, could be considered a national security emergency requiring emergency judicial action. At that time, the Supremes could order that special elections be held barely months into the future to replace the displaced senators and congressional representatives probably the most remarkable positive event in American history. Tell me what's going on. Okay, this morning, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, set a date for conference June 22nd. That's, gosh, what, two weeks from now? To, to take a vote, the nine of them will vote on my Rule 11 petition for writ of certiorari. The Rule 11 is stamped right on the face of the document. This is the first Rule 11 petition for writ of certiorari that has been filed since the 70s. The first time a Rule 11 petition for writ of certiorari has ever been filed or allowed to be filed by a pro se, someone representing themselves, ever in the history of the Supreme Court. This is the first ever. But we didn't think that they would accept it under Rule 11. They have to approve it. They have to look at it and they have to decide that it is of quote, imperative public importance. Otherwise they won't dock it. So we thought they were gonna send it back, but they didn't. So we have a conference coming up the 22nd. And That's a conference it. means at least four justices, right? Right, at least four justices out of the nine votes. If four of them vote to have a public date for a hearing, then we get a public date for a hearing. So the 22nd, is when the justices will make a decision. And if uh, they decided for the whole panel to hear it, then when would that be done? Uh, if they decide that, then it would probably be October because they're breaking for the summer. So right. we'd probably have an October hearing date. And that's where both sides get to go in front of the justices and argue. I'm the plaintiff. I'm actually the attorney. I'm the attorney and counsel of record for the petitioner, and I'm also the petitioner. So it's a chance for me to be an attorney for a short period of time without ever going to law school. Yeah, I was just thinking I would love to have some some video of your face as you first sit down at your first attorney job in the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. And it'd be so great because they know I'm not a professional, so I could get away with, you know, I just I wouldn't try to get away with anything, but I would just say, hey, you know, we learn as we go here. But right. it's so, such a simple argument. Article six. It's just so clear and so simple. I have a feeling is most judges are very forgiving of that and even try to, to coach uh, the new person. Yeah. Well, if you go to SupremeCourt.gov, you can actually look at the cover of the of the of the petition. You can look at the whole contents, but the front of it, Rule Eleven, right there, on it. Okay. So yeah. now, under a best case scenario, what would happen? There's there's an op, there's something that could happen that I've only mentioned one other time, and that was this morning. And that is the federal court could, in a way, wash their hands of this by uh, by overturning the motion to dismiss. They could remand it back to the federal court, and the federal court would then 
require the defendants to, within 21 days, answer the complaint. In other words, uh, they could flush the motion to dismiss down the toilet, and it was pretty much based on immunity. So the court simply remanding it back to the federal court, in a way, could like, let's let the federal court make these decisions and not us. We'll just remove the uh, the motion to dismiss and let it move forward that way. And that would be incredible. That would be absolutely amazing because you'd have 388 defendants with then with a deadline to respond. And if they don't respond within that deadline, they are in default. And in order for them to respond, uh, this if the attorneys, the U.S. attorneys, I don't think would represent them because there would be a huge conflict of interest potential there. And any attorney that represents multiple defendants when there's a cause of action that includes civil conspiracy or conspiracy action, cause of action, uh, you're malpracticing if you represent uh, more than one defendant or you risk being sued for malpractice. And so they would have to, to do it properly, they would need to find 388 different law firms and every single one of those law firms would have to uh, do a, ch a, a background check to make sure that they had not uh, had any relationship with any of the other 387 defendants. So it could, could create some problem. <laughs> Let, let's pretend that somebody's viewing this who doesn't know anything about what this is about. So could you give me like a little one or two minutes? Oh, sure, let me condense it. We are suing all of those members of Congress and, the, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Mike Pence for allowing, uh, not pushing back against the certification of the electoral votes on, on the 2020 election without a 10-day pause for an investigation. So in other words, we're suing everyone that pushed back, that voted basically didn't allow a 10-day investigation to happen when 144 members of Congress had a mountain of evidence saying, hey, it's like we've sworn to defend the Constitution, defend the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And here we have proof that 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 we have a breach. We have a huge security breach here and would better darn well find out how serious it is, regardless of whether they think it might have affected the outcome or not. They needed to investigate and they didn't. So we're suing them for breach of, for violating their oath of office, for treason, several civil actions. And every day that passes, there's more and more confirmed evidence of this. Uh, right. the, the latest of which is nothing less than YouTube now allowing you to talk about election interference in the 2020 election, which is huge. I got strikes up one side and down the other from YouTube talking about this. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and again, it's not about the outcome. It's like, regardless of how minor the evidence might be, they don't even need evidence. When you go to a police officer, a police station, and say you believe a crime has been committed and you're a reasonable person, they are obligated to investigate. So when you have 144 members of Congress saying, it looks like we've had a major security breach in our election system, which really produces the same results as an act of war. And that's what President Trump truth and we truth we truth about this case in an article quoting that an act of war of the victor puts in its new leader. And so a robbed election uh, produces the same results as a, an act of war. That's another reason why this is so important as it's, you know, it's imperative public importance as Rule 11 requires, allowing us to bypass the 10th Circuit, which they did. Well, this is this is the constitutional relief for this problem. Uh, it's, it really it's is. And here it you really got is. you got guys 200 years ago trying to figure out now what do we do if uh, you know, right. this yeah. is the only thing they came yeah. up with and they just yeah. ignored that. Right. Now, people, some people say, well, one branch of government doesn't have the power to remove another, to, to mess with the other branch. And it's like, that's that's not true. Uh, the Supreme Court actually has the power to uphold a capital punishment uh, decision from a lower court in a state. And a capital punishment decision, capital offense, is death. And so that's a form of removing someone from office, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> so they do have this incredible power. And I think the Congress, some of the some people in Congress see this power and they're trying to do whatever they can to to prevent it from happening, used in this way. And they want to stack the court, they want to 
you know, they want to impeach members of the justices and so on and so forth. So there's a time, a timing here. And what's so beautiful about this case is we've been able to, the first case was like a shot across the bow where people are waking up to it. The Supreme Court could even be seen, hey, in their careers as Supreme Court justices, they have never experienced this uh, Rule 11. The, last, the only one they've experienced is my brother's which they allowed, but it wasn't docketed as a Rule 11 because the Tenth Circuit hearing made a decision which prevented the need for a Rule 11. But this one, this, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals didn't have any chance at all because we knew what we were doing this time. And we filed this, we sent this petition off before the U.S. attorneys had even had a chance or they hadn't even filed a motion to dismiss. So the Tenth Circuit could not possibly make a decision, which was one of the the main reason, I think, and then they had to decide to allow it to be uh, docketed and filed as a Rule 11 petition for writ of certiorari. Well, you have to think that, you know, these justices, or at least some of them, are truly interested in the preservation of the United States of America. And they, they like we, are reading these news items as they're developing, and it's obvious now that this is just not some conspiratorial notion of Trumpers, that there's actual evidence of massive fraud. I mean, yeah. the, the truck driver guy who drove 300,000 Pennsylvania ballots already voted to uh, be just before the election from hit the printing plant in Long Island up to, to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to and then they all disappeared, uh, undoubtedly to be deposited ultimately as part of a legitimate Pennsylvania vote. I mean, that has now come to the fore, and that's that's just one. You know, there, there are tip, there's uh, uh, other violations, similar violations in Arizona and other states. And these, you know, the justices have to be thinking about this and thinking, you know, we're about to run into a situation where if this goes one step further in the wrong direction, we won't have a republic anymore. That's right. And the, that's why the letter campaign is so important. People can go to LloydBrunson.com and they can do a digital letter that is actually printed and turned into a physical letter going to the Supreme Court. And every single letter is filed. It's like a part, being a part of history. And so that's so important. The Supreme Court of the United States really needs public support. They need to know the public is behind it because they work for we, the people. And to do it on their own, would be more much more difficult. So the letters coming in over 70,000 with my brother's petition, which is a foundation which helps in this new uh, this new letter campaign. So uh, I think I think we've got a chance for a hearing. I, th I think we've got a good chance for a hearing. And and if they deny it on June 22nd, we will file a petition for rehearing. And every single day the letters are stacking up, encouraging the justices to make a decision that they can feel comfortable with. So. This is a process and an opportunity for people to participate like never before. And now every single day, more evidence comes out. And yeah, I mean, if, if you really like the United States, like the freedom that it has provided people, you've got to be considering things like this. Right. And it's not even the, the evidence is, is wildly, it's, you know, it's really showing that they should have launched an investigation. But remember, we don't need more than even one witness for them to be required to launch an investigation. If one member of Congress feels like and shows a little bit of evidence, they have better, they're required to launch an investigation. And for all those people that hoods, that held the, waved the Constitution saying, it's my constitutional duty to certify these electoral votes, it's like, wait a minute, you've got to make sure they are real electoral votes. And if there's fraud involved, fraud vitiates everything, the legal term, you better make darn well sure those are real electoral votes before you go headstrong into certifying something that might be not, not be certifiable. And so they were all claiming that, oh, we've been asked to just not certify. No, that was a big lie. They were simply asked to pause on the certification, not cancel the certification. So the deceit just adds to the evidence of the complaint that they need to be removed from office. Beth's daughter lives in Pennsylvania, and she keeps saying over and over, I can't believe we put Fetterman into office. Well, maybe you didn't. Absolutely. Absolutely. Every executive and legislative decision that has happened uh, that, that has been unconstitutional should be used quite plain. Absolutely. So this gives the Supreme Court more power than it's ever been giving. 
they could simply, during the summer break, they could simply adjudicate the case, cancel. They could just simply order the U.S. Marshal Service to go to the sergeant in arms with the list of defendants canceling their federal credentials, their federal office credentials. It could be that simple. And a few broadcast teams going to CNN and a few others so that they could replace those temporarily so that people get the real news that, that there's a smooth transition happening. And look at the hundreds of mil, maybe a billion dollars or more worth of campaign money that would go into supporting this decision to fill the vacancies that 388 defendants uh, would have to uh, leave their office to create these vacancies for new campaigns to uh, to support their candidates in. So it could be a very positive experience. So, has, has this increased your, your chances, uh, in your opinion, of, you know, making real change happen? Oh, absolutely. Just the awareness alone. You know, people didn't know that there was supposed to be a binding oath. And people didn't know that they'd given themselves immunity. And people didn't know that even state statutes exclude politicians in the oath of office when it comes to perjury. They didn't know that they had actually let themselves off from perjury charges if they lie about the most sacred thing they could lie about, the oath of office. So the public awareness factor is very powerful. It's huge and it's growing. Okay, well, that's great. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, just go go do a letter. There's a great video at LloydBrunson.com explaining how you can do a letter without using the internet and a, and a way to do it quickly by using the internet, LloydBrunson.com. And if you want to get an actual physical copy of the petition, act, act, we printed extra ones that we sent to the Supreme Court. If you want to have a physical copy, perfect bound with a certified word count, it's pretty complex uh, a piece of work. You can actually get copies of those. Uh, if you scroll down to LloydBrunson.com, you can scroll down and click on a link there and it'll take you to a place where you can get that. And my revolutionary pocket-sized book that ex that highlights these power clauses that we're using in the, uh, in the documents. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, Bill. Thank you.